What's up, you guys? Once again, it's movie retrospective time. Going back to the 1970s. This is kind of uh, one I don't really hear a lot of people talking about. I remember seeing it, but I forgot all about it. Yeah, this is, I think, the first time that I heard about this. It's Rituals from 1977. I think the first time I heard of this was in the Stephen King book, Dance Macabre. And he didn't really, like, talk about it at length, but it was in... He had, like, an index in the back of the book where he kind of recommended 100 really good movies. This was pre-1980. Uh, and ones that he thought didn't really get seen enough. And this one was on there. Now, when we were watching it last night, though, I was like, when we got to the one part, like, particularly around the climax part where they were, like, on the ridge, uh, I remembered a lot of that. So I must have seen it at some point in the past. And, you know, because it sounded so familiar. And the reason, this is this is so weird, like, the reason that I put it in the Patreon poll was because Shudder just added it. Because I think it got released on Blu-ray not too long ago. But then, for whatever reason, we couldn't get Shudder to work last night. Like, it just kept, like, sitting there and we couldn't get anything out of it. So we ended up having to watch a free one that someone had uploaded to YouTube, which was okay but it looked like it had been transferred from vhs and it was like really really dark so you couldn't really see dark and blurry we, yeah you couldn't really see what was going on toward the end so i had to kind of we had to kind of like squint at it and then i had to kind of go and read all the plot synopses so i could figure out what the fuck was going on because some of the shit you couldn't see but yeah this is actually it's a canadian movie and I think what ended up happening with this, one, um, it got dismissed a lot because I think at the time people just thought, oh, it's a Canadian deliverance ripoff, which it's not really. Um, and also something that happened too, like when it came out, it's sort of like the distribution was just very lackluster. So it just kind of didn't really go anywhere. You know what I'm saying? I can see what they're talking about with it being uh, like deliverance. It was like deliverance. It was that same kind of idea. Dude dudes out in the wilderness and they're not in their environment and they run into some bad motherfuckers. Yeah, I mean the setup is the same. Happens, yeah. But this it almost in the way this is structured, it's almost structured more like a slasher movie yeah. than Deliverance. Yeah, they don't run into hillbillies per se. Think of it as like they more like they run into Jason basically. Yeah, except it's yeah. a real dude, it's but real, yeah. yeah, it's a dude like bent for revenge type of thing. So that's in that sense it's more like an 80s slasher. Yeah, but he is like Jason in some ways. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And this really has, man, this had like an all-star cast. Like the guy that directed it, Peter Carter, I guess he hadn't really done a lot. He worked like a lot of he did like TV movies and stuff. He did um like a Klondike Fever, uh, an adaptation of that, which is a Jack London book. Uh, he, like I said, he did some TV stuff, but he died in like 1982. Um, but yeah, this has kind of like a, sort of like an all-star cast, or, or at least like a lot of really good, like sort of recognizable actors, but really good character actors. Uh, Hal Holbrook is kind of like the main character. Classing up the joint. Classing up the joint. And yeah. Hal Holbrook's been in like a million things. Yeah. I still love him from Creep Show, man. Yeah. But, uh, Lawrence Dane was in this, too. I think nowadays he's probably best known for Bride of Chucky, but he's yeah. been in a bunch of other stuff, too. And Robin Gamel, who was in this, he played Martin, I think. And I kept, like, the whole movie, I was kind of like, where have I seen that bitch before? He's, like, so fucking, uh, he's so fucking familiar. And when I looked up his Wikipedia page, he was actually the one of the, like, the creepy dude from The Haunting of Julia, a.k.a. Full Circle, which I've seen a bunch of times. And I was like, oh, well, that's where I've seen him before. He was also in a movie called Nightmares from 1983, that anthology movie. Yeah. I think Emilio Estevez was in that. I need to see that again. I remember the only the only uh, portion of that I remember is the Bishop of Battle, like the killer video game thing. So I don't even remember like what the other stories were. I got to write that down so we got to see that. But yeah, so I can kind of see where it comes off. It's like, oh, it's kind of like Deliverance because what you have is five guys and they're all doctors in varying capacities. One's like this hotshot surgeon. Uh, one used to be a surgeon but couldn't hack it anymore, so now he's a general practitioner. One is kind of like, because um, at the beginning, aren't they like talking about I'm gonna do like dick filler kind of stuff? <laughs> like he's yeah. just he's just trying to like do. Because I think medical ethics is like a big theme of this movie. Because I think that kind of turns out to be what the guy is stalking them about, sort of. Yeah, which I, I kind of find that that boy, isn't that convenient? That there's a dude with a grudge against doctors just happens to be out there and just happens to find some doctors. 
I don't. I, I well, I don't really know because the the five doctors they it, you know it's set up in the movie that they do like a wilderness trip like every year like yeah. as a kind of bonding thing. But I don't know if they necessarily go to the same place because what's the chances of there being a dude out there kind of like Jason who hates doctors? Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, it's, it's just, like a slasher movie in the sense that you yeah. don't like really think about it too much. It's 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 a good movie. The tone in some ways kind of reminds me for some weird reason like Duel. Remember Duel? Yeah. Kind of, that's kind of what, the, but it, but it looks like a Vietnam movie from the time. There's a lot of fucking Vietnamish type terrain and guys with fucking black kind of like soot on their faces to make like, or they're getting dirty, but it looks like camouflage to me. And they're walking through the damn forest trying to survive being hunted down by the this fucking dude. They never see him. Not until know, the end. Not until the very end. And it just kind of reminds me of, like, imagine if Duel had not one dude versus a truck, but a truck versus, like, five dudes. That's what it's like. <laughs> Except the truck is Except a person. Except the truck is a person. <laughs> and instead of being on a road, they're out in the woods. No, there's just something about so it. So really not like it. But no, it, I know what you're there's saying. There's something about the tone and the edit. And I think what it is is because it's the movie's mostly about, like, the tension of the unknown. You never see the truck driver. So maybe that's the yeah. part that kind of... Spoiler alert for Duel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You only yeah. see his arm. That's the only right. thing you ever see. They did that also with the car. Yeah. Which is the the, the drive. The, like, yeah, the car the was the devil, so you never really saw inside. You know, they opened the window. The dude looked, he saw the shit, and was, oh, but you never see what he saw. Right. You know, and there was like a lot of that kind of shit in it, in a, in a certain way. But you I kind of get that. And like I said, yeah. I kind of like this one. This one I thought was like really good because not only, it, you know, and it did kind of like that really good thing that, you know, decent horror movies do where it's like they set up the tension between all your main characters, like before you even get to you know, the bad shit or the person that's stalking them. So they not only have that to contend with, but they also have kind of like nature to contend with, which, you know, is sort of augmented by the person that's stalking them. But they, for a long time, they don't know who it is that's stalking them or why they're stalking them. And, you know, the, so there's kind of like a red herring kind of situation too, which I'll get into in a minute. But yeah, so you have these five doctors, like I said, um, you know, they're, they kind of like establish a little bit of their personalities and like how their ethics and morality and stuff like that differ. So, cause that'll play into the story later on. Yeah. Some of them are good guys. Some of them are fucking cowards and shit, you know? Just yeah. Like yeah. Like I said, so, um, you know, and it's kind of established they've been friends a long time. They do this every year. One dude's, one dude's obsessed with other people being alcoholics when he himself, I think is an alcoholic. <laughs> really, he's talking about people being on the sauce and saw what sauce artists. No, juice artist. Juice artist. That's what it is. Yeah, the juice first time artist. that he said that, like, like he, he called somebody a juice artist. I'm like, is that a heroin addict? Yeah, like, what the hell is but that? But then what later the on artist? when they, because I had never heard that phrase, but then yeah. later on, like, they said something else. And in context, I said, oh, he must mean like an yeah, alcoholic. He's worried about other people drinking. There's a lot of alcoholism going on in this movie. Yeah. Something that I didn't really realize, this didn't really stick out to me, and this was kind of like a, this is kind of like a big thing for 1977. One of the characters, I think it was Martin, uh, is gay, but they don't. Which one, which one was that? He was um, the one. He he was the one that was like contending, I guess, with uh, Hal Holbrook. I think that's the one that okay. that I were talking about. And it's like, and I think it's only mentioned like one time, or it's brought up. And I was like, wow, that's like actually kind of cool that it's just kind of like in there and nobody really brings it up. So yeah. I thought that was kind of neat. It's like that doesn't really happen much in seventies movies. Usually, it's like. The, the character is gay and that's like the only yeah, he, character yeah. trait or yeah. it's like the butt of a he's joke flame, still. He's got to flame the fuck out all the Right, time. but it's like, I didn't, it, it's so subtle that I didn't even like realize until I was reading a plot synopsis and I was like, oh yeah, I guess so. It's like it didn't even stand out Well, they're all doctors so they don't give a shit. Yeah, that's a, yeah, nobody gives a shit. Yeah. So they go to this place um, in northern Ontario. So like I said, this was a Canadian movie. They shot this for only $600,000, and I think most of those actors did almost all of their own stunts, which if you see this movie is pretty impressive, <laughs> I have to say. I'm sure I would not if I was an actor. I'd be like, no, thanks. I'll be in my trailer. But um, yeah, get somebody else to do it. But so they go to this place and it's called, don't they say it's called the Cauldron of the Moon, right? Because they said so. like the, the indigenous tribes in the area, like they have a legend that 
the moon like bumped into the earth at that point and like yeah. made this big huge like chasm and it has like this river down in the middle yeah. um so that there's kind of like something made of that like you know how they're saying oh the indigenous cri- tribes they say it's like big medicine and it's supposed to be like magic and then when they're all drunk later on around the fire they make jokes about what if this place really was magic and what if this and that and the other so uh so yeah it's all that so they get dropped off by a plane and then they uh, go and they do their first campsite. They all get drunk. One of them inexplicably has brought a blow-up doll. Um, <laughs> I guess he brought it as a joke. I guess so, but it yeah. just seems like when, just just a pro tip: when you're going into the wilderness where there's like literally nothing else and no one else around, probably you should use the room that that would take up to take something more useful. Well, it's inflatable though. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's inflatable. But it's like you could have like the room that that took up. You could have taken a whole other roll of toilet paper. You could have taken an extra pair of shoes, I think which just, does come up. I think they were. Just, I think. I think it was just. <laughs> it was just a gag. I know, so but it was just something that I was. Woman, you know. Because they were like sitting around the fire yeah. drinking, and I was like, "For real? Did he just? Did he bring a blow up doll? He's blowing yeah. up a blow up doll like yeah. around the fire." And I was just like, "Okay, you do you, whatever." Um, and I love the like the one guy who's the drunkie. He's basically like they go in his pack later on because like some of their packs get lost. It's like basically all that's in his pack is toilet paper and scotch. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what's always funny about what's always funny about the blow up dolls is that when you see them at the gag store, they say blow up doll, and on the fucking on, on the on the packaging, they show a photograph of a real woman. But there you see the doll blown up, it just looks like a fucking looks like a flotation device for the swimming pool. Fucking but ridiculous. that big gross the mouth on it. Gross ass mouth. <laughs> Kind of like you'd even want that thing, you know what I mean? You'd even want that thing. Well, see, this is, well, this was the 70s when they didn't have, like, the blow-up doll technology. They didn't like, have the, the real doll. Like, the sex doll technology, yeah. yeah. They didn't have Although, the real doll I think doll the blow-up dolls were always gags. I think yeah, were, I, I did anyone, always... I'm sure some people really use them for their intended purpose. <laughs> I don't know, man. Because it's a big world out there. I can't, yeah, but I think they were gags. They... But most, I'm sure 99% yeah. of them were bought as jokes. Yeah. As joke some, gifts. To give to some dude who couldn't get laid. <laughs> Or like you know, I I've seen them like blown up and kind of like put on uh, on the back of your motorcycle, on the back of your motorcycle or yeah. something like that, or like at bachelor parties and yeah. stuff like that. I've seen that kind of shit. So yeah, so so they get dropped off there. They're hanging out drinking with the with the blow up doll, and uh, when they wake up the next morning, they find that inexplicably all of their boots are missing. Hmm, wonder who could have taken that. So uh, so one of them, whose name is DJ, and I guess he was the one that organized the trip, and we should note, is the only one that was smart enough to actually bring an extra pair of shoes, because he yells at them. He's kind of like, I sent you, like, guys, like a Xerox thing. All you had to bring, yeah, he's like, all you had to bring was toilet paper. I think he said toilet paper and an extra pair of shoes. And it's like, you bitches couldn't even handle that. And he gets really pissed off about it. What's funny, though, is having somebody been in the infantry fucking, and you know, been in the worst fucking possible environments in Korea and fucking the Middle East and shit. I challenge these motherfuckers here, one, to keep toilet paper dry, especially civilian toilet paper. Well, you no, there them, is no dry toilet paper by the end of this movie. No, <laughs> no. no. military toilet paper comes sealed in the damn pack from your MREs, and uh, you don't open that until you're going to use it. So it, it, I think it's funny. Just civilians, uh, bring toilet paper, and they got a fucking roll of toilet paper. Yeah, that'll last... And that'll well, last I mean, a day. even uh, look, I'm dumb, and I yeah. would even like at least put the shit in a plastic bag or something. Jeez, don't even just it, put it in there; it'll get it's humid in Florida. Yeah, even in a Ziploc bag, it wouldn't last long. Well, like I said, it's better than just yeah. like throwing it in there with yeah. nothing around it for Christ's sake. Especially in the environment that they were in, you couldn't do a river crossing, and water just makes its way into everything eventually. That's what I'm saying. Maybe it's because yeah. I grew up in Florida, where it's you know like, the, whereas the air is yeah. wet. Right. So it's like, even if you took it outside, yeah, outside it would get wet. So yeah. you have to do something to like prevent yeah. that yeah. from happening. What's well, so much better is those damn baby wipes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they take up less room too. Yeah, I mean, depending on how many and you that need. That tube. Yeah, we True. take the baby wipes, and then we had hundred mile an hour tape sealing it. The lid closed so the moisture couldn't get out and nothing could get in and then you pull the fucking tape off and fucking use them and then put it as you shower sh- fucking toilet paper and a shower in a fucking plastic there you in go a plastic fucking, it, can, it does everything does everything <laughs> although thank MR- you makers of baby wipes although mres help out because uh the turd just falls out like a damn brick you yeah. hardly need any damn toilet paper for that that might be too much information yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a greasy brick Ew. They're designed for that shit. It's like <laughs> they learned that they learned that shit from the astronauts, giving those astronauts food. 
<laughs> they did. I love that, like, the when the astronauts come back to Earth and they get debriefed. So how was the shitting? Yeah, how the shit? Did, did, did come out in a single piece and just lubricated its way Well, out I mean, I know it's gross, but yeah. that is information yeah, that, yeah. that you need to know. And it does yeah. make people's lives better, like, yeah. on down the line. So I know it's, like, funny. Oh, space-age shit. But I know it's funny, but, yeah, yeah. It's, it's good that they asked them that it's kind of funny. stuff. <laughs> so, uh, so DJ, uh, after excoriating everybody for not bringing extra shoes like he told them to, yeah. uh, he's the only one that has extra shoes. He's like, all right, so the rest of you bitches just fucking stay here he's like i think there's a hydro dam uh not far from here like a few miles from here i think it, what was it 15 miles no. did they say it was 15 miles i don't remember how far it was but he said there's a there's a hydro dam maybe there's somebody there i'm gonna hike there and see if we can you know get some help or get some other shoes or something like that so he takes off now the rest of them they're basically like uh, the next morning, like they like he leaves, and then the next morning they start getting like even more alarmed because I think they're in the same uh, campsite. But when they wake up, they find this really weird ritualistic type of thing that's like a stick, and it's like a deer head. And then there was like a snake around it. I didn't realize this when I was watching it, but I was reading the plot synopsis. They said, oh, it's it looks like a, a Caduceus yeah. thing. You know what I mean? Like the rod of Asclepius or whatever. Um, so yeah, so that's what that was meant to represent. So at that point, they're like, okay, um, somebody's fucking with us. Now, because DJ has gone off, and what DJ, I think one of the other guys there is that guy's brother. So that causes more tension because everybody's like, well, it's got to be DJ, like, fucking with us and, like, doing a joke and stuff like that. And the brother, I think as he was able, is like, um, yeah, he wouldn't do that. So they have, like, a bunch of fights about that. But they're like, well, regardless, if it's somebody else, then we need to get the fuck out of here because somebody is, like, doing some creepy shit, like, right around while we're sleeping, and that's not cool. So, um, so at that point, they kind of, they start kind of trekking away. They, none of them have shoes. So I think they wrap all their, uh, feet in like rags and plastic bags and shit like that. And then, uh, there's kind of a thing where they, somebody sees like a, like a person kind of like at the top of this ridge, but then like this person throws like a beehive on them. Yeah. And one of them, I think it's Abel, um, is like thrown he either falls or is thrown off this ridge and breaks his neck on the way down. So he dies. Um, at this point, they're still thinking that maybe DJ is fucking with them. Not that he meant to kill the dude, but that, you know, that it, maybe it just happened accidentally. But like I said, so a lot of tension about that. They basically, now they leave that dude behind, right? They don't, like, take the body with them. They just leave that guy there. Um, so they so they basically were like, okay, fuck it, and then they just keep going. And then they have this whole other thing where um, they they find this rope that's across the river. So, like, stretched across. So they're like, okay, well, DJ must have been here, and he left this here so we'd know where he was. So they start going across the river on this rope, but it turns out that somebody has peppered the bottom of the river with little bear traps. And one of them steps in it, and it breaks their leg. That's Martin, I think. He's the drunk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it breaks their leg. Now, at this point, one of the dudes, Mitzi, it's actually not Martin. It's Mitzi and uh, Harry, who's played by Hal Holbrook. Those are kind of the two that are sort of left at the end, and they're the ones that are at odds all the time because Mitzi is the one that's like cowardly. Um, Martin, I think, was the gay guy, and he was the one in the drunk, and he was the one that got like his leg broken by the bear trap, if okay. I'm remembering correctly. So at this point, they're like, okay, they're still kind of like, well, did DJ do this? And I was like, D why would DJ do something like that? Like, you know, he'd break your leg or whatever. And at this point, Mitzi is kind of like, well, you know, Martin's leg is broken and we can't really like go any farther with him because we're going to have to carry him. And Harry is very adamantly, because Harry is kind of like represents like the very upright moral. He's like, we can't leave him behind. You know what I mean? He's still alive. Um, so he makes them like build a stretcher and they basically float the dude down the river and there's all and then they get in a fight and then like the dude is like floating down the fucking <laughs> he's gonna go over the fucking falls or whatever it's like this whole situation and i was just kind of laughing because the dude's drunk and he's because you know he's in a lot of pain and he's like floating away on the stretchers the two other guys are like punching each other because of like various shit like got an argument and i was just like Really, you guys are just going to let your friend kind of... You guys are having a slap fight, and he's going to go over the fucking waterfall. But yeah, so that's that whole thing. So uh, basically at this point, so the guy, uh, you know, the one with the broken leg, he's like laying there, and then the next morning they find that somebody has been in their camp again, 
and has left like a World War II era medal on the front of Martin's little sleeping bag or whatever. And at this point, I think there's, they also leave like some discharge papers and there's like an x-ray or something. So at this point, they're starting to suspect, okay, well, obviously this isn't DJ. This is somebody that has a grudge against doctors. Um, you know, maybe a doctor fucked him over at one point. He found out we were doctors by from watching us. And yeah, see, that's the thing. I don't think that the guy, like, yeah, it's coincidental, but I mean, the guy was watching them for a while because they do that whole like POV thing like they do in stalker movies. So the guy was obviously like listening to them talking like for a really long time before he decided he was going to do anything fucked up to them. I think, I mean, that's, that was the impression that I got. He's like, oh, well, here's these dudes in the woods. Oh, and they happen to be doctors. When? I'm going to go, like, in there and fuck with them. I kind of think that's what happened. So, so yeah. So, this guy obviously has a grudge against doctors. And it kind of wants them to figure out, like, what his beef is, I guess. Where he's, like, leaving all these little clues and stuff. So, like, x-rays and whatnot. Now, uh, so they get to the dam. And then they find that DJ made it to the dam but then it looked like somebody kind of like nailed him to a chair yeah, and like tortured him tortured and stuff him to death. and he's like sitting up there at yeah. which point mitzi is like let's get the fuck out of here and uh harry's like we can't leave him like this because he thought he was dead at first but he was like still but then he moved and he was like still alive and he's like dude this he's all fucked up we can't leave him like that so harry had to like strangle him and then at that point mitzi fucking he's like yeah i'm out and uh, Harry's like, hey, I can't carry Martin on the stretcher, like, all by myself. And he's just like, yeah, bye, good luck with that. Yeah. Um, and Harry's just like, fuck me. So he actually ends up having to drag, I mean, he end up, like, dragging Martin into the, like, inside where the dam is. And he's just kind of like, you know, I can't take you any further. He's like, I'm going to go get help and everything like that. But then it turns out that Martin's dead. And it was like, he oh, had that, been dead. Really. That was lucky. Yeah. But that was the thing. You didn't know how long he had been dead. Like, he could have been dead for a really long time. And they were just, like, dragging his corpse around. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so there's that whole thing. Actually, before that happens, um, there's that great scene, which is, I think, the main scene that I remembered from this, like, the first time I was seeing it, where they're up on the ridge and they're both carrying uh, Martin on the stretcher. And they fall asleep. And when they wake up... Um, their friend that died of the broken neck, like, earlier on, like, somebody left his head on a pike, like, yeah. on, at their campsite. And I love that, like, Harry just took the head and was just, like, flying. Yeah. <laughs> like, he throws it off the fucking, Dude. yep, I don't want to look at that. Fuck that shit. Because at first I was like, wait, whose head is that? But then I remembered that the guy whose neck that yeah. had broken, like, down the hill, they left the yeah, body I there. I wondered who that was, too. Yeah, and then I was like, oh, I think that's Abel. That's, that's the that guy. That yeah, that's that guy that fell down the hill. That was his head. So that guy's been, like, keeping the head the whole time. So at that point, so like I said, now they're separated. So Harry stumbles into this uh, cabin... And inside the cabin, at first, it's like he starts like pulling stuff. Like I said, the end of it was really dark. And I think even up until recently, all transfers of this, like the climax, because I've seen other people complaining about it, the climax of it is really, really dark. They said you can see it in the theater, but on most home media, at least up until the most recent one, you couldn't really see what was going on. It was like really, really dark and really muddied. So it looks like he goes into the into the cabin and then there's like i guess it's what like beef jerky or i don't know what it is i don't know what it is but he's like pulling it off the ceiling and eating it and then this old guy comes in and he starts attacking the old guy because he he finds like all their boots and stuff like in the cabin and then he finds out that this old guy is blind so obviously this isn't the dude who's been fucking with them the whole time his name is jesse but then it turns out that it's jesse's brother that has been doing all this stuff um and I guess what I think what ended up happening was that uh, the brother, I can't remember what the brother's name is, Matthew, Matthew. So Matthew, I guess, was all fucked up and deformed and stuff like that in the war. And he had wanted a doctor to essentially euthanize him so he wouldn't have to live like that. But the doctors just wanted to keep him alive for whatever reasons they could like squeeze because that was like a discussion that a lot of the guys had earlier on. Like, when do you know when to let a patient go? You can't just like leave them hanging on like forever just so you can like squeeze more money out of them or whatever. So I kind of feel like the the reason that the guy was pissed off was because that he had wished that the doctors would let him die instead of letting him live like that because he's all like fucked up looking. So he also burns Mitzi to death. Nobody feels too bad about that because Mitzi was kind of a dick. Um, 
basically cooks him. <laughs> yeah, I mean that last whole scene where Harry's in the in the cabin and then Mitzi is like hanging like out in the yard and Matthew I guess is kind of like building a fire around him or whatever. He's like he's gonna burn me, he's gonna burn me. And then like Mitzi keeps like yelling at Harry to come help him. But meanwhile, Harry has had like his leg, his like artery in his leg like stabbed by Matthew, and he's trying to like cauterize it so he doesn't bleed yeah, to death. Yeah, so, yeah, he blows his leg. He's like fuck. Yeah. But um, you know, and Mitzi is out there. It's just like he's trying to be nice at first. He's like, I'm sorry about all this shit I said. And it was come out here, you bastard. God damn it, I'm gonna die. Blah blah blah. And I'm just like, you know what? Just just let him die. And then Harry just keeps going. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Because he's trying to like fucking fix his leg. I'll I'll be with you in a moment. But uh, it doesn't work. Mitzi gets burned to death. And like I said, no one's uh, all that upset about it. And uh, so Harry actually does manage to, uh, you know, kind of save the day or win the day rather he doesn't save the day because everybody dies but he actually does manage to get away and he gets to a road um and just basically sits there waiting for a car and i said at the end he's like sitting there in the middle of the road i said would it be sad right now if he just like got hit by a bus like something just went by and shit like that but yeah so as you can see even though the setup of this is i will admit very similar to deliverance uh, you know, it's five guys, friends, and they're out in the wilderness, and they're being stalked by something. But like I said, it's like Deliverance, but it's like a stalker version of Deliverance. You could also say it was almost like Predator, but with no guns. You could say it was like that, too. Yeah, that, too. Yeah, yeah it's you... not. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that, you know... Um, and the the I think the, like the the climax part at the end where Harry's like fighting the deformed dude in the cabin that's also been kind of compared to like Straw Dogs the Sam Peckinpah movie which yeah I can see that so yeah this was actually I think it was made for less than a million dollars or six hundred thousand Canadian um, and like Pretty I said yeah and I mean and like I said most of the the actors uh, did almost all of their own stunts and it just seemed like but when they made it. It just seemed like the distributors of it were just kind of like, eh. And they didn't really do any. So it took like a really long time. Like I said, it played in some theaters, like in a limited capacity in Canada and the U.S. But then even on like VHS, because I remember seeing the VHS cover back in the day. But even when it was out on DVD and shit like that, like it seemed like the transfer was kind of shitty um, and kind of muddy. But I think just maybe a couple years ago, uh, or maybe more recently than that, they did actually put out... Um, a blu-ray that uh, i think it was scorpion releasing and they and it's actually like remastered and i've heard from other reviews they said it's slightly slightly scratchy because they had to use from the original print and that's all they had but they said other than that it's it looks pretty good you know what i mean and that's probably like the best it's ever going to look because you know, it, it just got kind of fucked over and nobody really gave that much of a shit so about it. It's kind of a it. forgotten movie. It is. Yeah. And uh, like I said, so it's kind of cool. Like I said, I'd heard the title, um, you know, from Stephen King bringing it up. I'm pretty sure I And saw I, this yeah, movie. I thought I hadn't seen it, but when it got to that scene of the ridge with the head on the stick, I'm like, no, I did see this because I remembered the head on the stick and I remembered them arguing over whether they should leave the dude on the on the stretcher behind. I remembered that whole sequence. Um, so I said, okay, well, I must have seen this at some point, but I just like, I probably just watched it on YouTube because sometimes I'll put on YouTube like some of those channels that have like forgotten 70s movies and I'll just kind of have it going on in the background. So I must have seen it like in that capacity. I kind of remembered the scene where they uh, got their, where they woke up and their boots were gone. I yeah. I kind of remembered that. That's about, that's the only thing I kind of remembered. Unless it's maybe it's reminded me of something else, but but it's I think kind of I saw this movie. It's kind of a shame because I think one of the best things about this movie, like I said, it's not. It's called a slasher movie. It's sort of a slasher movie, but not exactly. Um, I guess it's kind of like a psychological slasher movie in the sense that they have somebody stalking them that's doing like fucked up shit to them. It's a decent flick. It is. It's actually pretty decent. And um, you know, considering some of the other stuff that came out in the '70s, like like I said, there was a lot of really good stuff, but there was a lot of kind of trash as well. And it seemed kind of sad. You know, I, I feel like Canadian films in general are not not usually the things that people jump to at first. Other than you know, Black Christmas is probably this, the best. This wasn't one. '70s trash. Oh, not at all. No, this was, uh, you know, it was up there with, like I said, Duel, The Island. No, not quite as big budget as The Island, but similar. Remember uh, with, what's his name? Yeah. Fucking, um, David Warner and Michael Caine. Michael Caine, yeah. Uh, similar, up, up, you know, Deliverance, that type, that type of movie. Yeah, and I think one of the best things about this um, is the acting and the character interplay. 
Like I really no, liked. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really liked a lot of the dialogue, and I really liked a lot of the interplay between the characters. Um, and it's just, I don't know, it was just like a really good, because it's almost kind of like had a psychological thing to it. And then there was like a wilderness survival yeah, shit to it. it almost kind of goes like uh, uh, Lord of the Flies, kind of, in a certain way. They all start turning on each other. A little bit, they yeah. They going kind of feral and shit pretty good yeah because and like i said i like i think they did a good job of making the characters likable but also really flawed yeah. and i think they it was really good like they economically set up everyone's sort of world views and how they conflicted with one another i think they did that like in a really good like a naturalistic kind of way i would like to have seen a better print of it yeah like i said there as far again. as i know yeah there, it's um the the version that's on shutter they just added that so that must be the newest like definitive version yeah i'd like to go back and, and see it's that. kind of a shame that we couldn't get shutter to load last night so we couldn't watch the good one so we had to watch kind of like a shitty muddy one that was on youtube it wasn't terrible but you couldn't really see, like when it was dark, you couldn't really see much of yeah. what was going on. So I think there's two different versions of them, but they're this two different. People have posted this, I think, twice on YouTube. It's yeah. up there for free. Oh, um, and uh, d and stay away from. There was another version of this called The Creeper, um, which is the same movie except with 11 minutes cut out of it. Yeah, so you might as well. Uh, so it. don't bother. Yeah. I think that was for a U.S. release. Uh, I don't know why they would cut 11 minutes out. But because this isn't try to make it PG or something, I guess this isn't a super gory movie. I mean, there's there's a there's a severed head and there's like shit like that. But and there's violence, but it's not I don't know. It's not like super gory or anything. So I don't really know what 11 minutes they would take it out. But whatever. Uh, but yeah, so definitely if you have Shudder uh, and you like kind of like survival horror, you like deliverance, you like kind of 70s slashers or anything like that. This is one that doesn't really get a lot of attention and it's definitely worth it like i said it's got really good actors in it and it's just i don't know i, I enjoyed it quite a bit uh so yeah check it out if you have shutter like i said the youtube one is passable but not that great so i would recommend watching it on shutter or getting the blu-ray uh, and that will do it for this movie retrospective we will see you guys on the next one bye <laughs>